Thank you for listening to Mailbox Money, your guided tour through safe, sacred, and speculative investing with a plan and a purpose to do more good with newfound peace of mind. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Mailbox Money. I'm Jackson Wood, joined as always by Ryan Kruger, my partner. In today's episode, we are going to be talking about ignoring stock prices and thinking like a business owner. Now, typically, this this style of topic or this theme would come up when prices are down, and you know investors are trying to convince themselves not to worry and not to focus on the price and, you know, trying to teach themselves a lesson. But as prices are up and we've seen a lot of, you know, funny things happen in a relatively strong market, I think it's even important to remind ourselves of this as we see prices go in, you know, go up and go in a favorable direction. And and instead of thinking about prices and the fluctuation there, thinking as a business owner and how important this is for an investor. Um, And for those of you that have listened, I can't believe we are on episode 74 already. Every time I write the show notes and type the title of the episode in, I put the number there. I can't believe we've had 74 of these. So so thank you for sticking along this this far. Um, But for those of you that have listened, you know by now that we are dividend growth investors. And so our goal when, when it comes to investing is to generate a stream of sustainable dividend income that grows over time that outpaces inflation that you can add next to your steady income, like a pension or social security. And we do that through very careful investment in dividend growth stocks, right? Our investment plans, what we call our one page financial plan or our freedom day plan, they do not depend on market fluctuations. We are not investing in momentum or trend or buying or selling volatility or anything other than we want to design a plan that has one stream of income that grows year over year over year. And that's accomplished through investing in quality dividend growth companies. So something that Ryan has mentioned that I was actually thinking about over the weekend is if they closed the market tomorrow, I don't really think it would matter all that much. And I'll tell you how I finally had this click. I've said it for a long time. I've heard it. I believe it. But I don't know if anybody else listening has an iPhone they'll send you the update, you know, the new software update. And if you're anything like me, you'll just delay it, delay it, delay it till eventually you decide, all right, I need to update my phone and you download the new, the new iOS service or whatever. And then it updates your whole plan. Well, when I updated my phone on Friday, I didn't realize that my stock app didn't down, didn't update. And so on Monday, I'm looking for my prices on my phone and I realized this isn't working. I don't know what is going on here. And I realized that I hadn't I had to re-download the stock app. And so I, I did this little experiment where I said, you know what, I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna look at this. Let's see what happens. And it had in in fact no real uh, effect on the way that my portfolio is managed. And for investors, um, not updating your stock app is probably a beneficial thing, as we're going to learn from Warren Buffett later on here today. Now, for portfolio managers, I think it's pretty important that we get price movements and fundamental changes and, and get to really roll up our sleeves here. But it really wouldn't matter for most investors and most people wanting to just build retirement income if the market closed. And that's because the companies that you own would still pay you a quarterly dividend regardless. You are an owner of the company and you would still get that good old fashioned mailbox money. Um, and those dividend checks. And I, I thought that that was an important thing. And I could see Ryan here is about ready to, to jump at me. So what you got? I, I, I am excited about today. I'm, I'm in 74 episodes. You're thinking, I'm just getting warmed That's up. Right. I mean, it, I, I'm, I'm going to, we try to make this super accessible, open our playbook for everybody. We've been really um, delighted to hear, and we love your feedback. We love your questions um, from brand new investors to some of the most sophisticated investors I know enjoying different topics and different episodes. That that makes me smile because I do think the holy grail is informed simplicity. So this shouldn't turn off the most sophisticated or brand new investors. That was our modest goal to start with. But I, I'm I'm a nerd out and I'm going to share today to back your wonderful topic of thinking like a business owner. I'm going to share one of my favorite, less than one handful of metrics. I'll nerd out the mathlete here 
if I was on a deserted island when your market was closed for 10 or more years, if I was on a deserted island, if I could only take one metric that we use to measure stocks, I'm going to share one of those today. Um, and if I had one business quote, I'm going to share what she said today too, also around your topic. And let's dig in. That's perfect. I mean, I'm excited to I have a sneak peek, but it fits seamlessly inside of this. So um, as we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, our approach here is to invest in high quality companies with rising dividends. Um, and that's what we focus on simply. We try to find companies that have the capacity to continue to boost their distributions over time. And so we think of this as a shareholder and what that means. Uh, we're firm believers in management teams of these companies, which focus on constantly sharing a portion of their profits with their investors. And uh, if they can continue to do that over time, we think that that is a good relationship there. So less on the price and more on this, uh, what you are receiving as a shareholder and as a stakeholder of the business. But at the end of the day, inside of your accounts, when you're able to purchase ownership of these high quality companies with growing dividends, you are most certainly going to experience volatility. We are not immune from it. We will see the volatility. It's just a, a fact of life in the way that this works. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to find a stock that fit this model and kind of walk through what's happening in the price um, over a 30 year period of time. So I selected Johnson and Johnson um, and I took the data for 30 years, starting all the way back in 1983. Um, so from 83 to 2013, and you can really pick any 30 year period of time there, but that, that's the one I ended up selecting. But during those 30 years, investors in Johnson & Johnson would have witnessed severe volatility around the 1987 stock market crash. I wasn't alive, but I've read all about it, pretty severe. They would have uh, witnessed price volatility in the oil shock in 1990 and 1991, um, not to mention the dot-com bubble and the credit crisis or the Great Recession. So the price would have been a uh, like a roller coaster. I mean, it was quite volatile, the price. So for a lot of investors, it scares them away. When they see the price move up and down, they get out, they sell, they just get terrified, emotion takes over. However, at the same time, in that 30 year period of time, the earnings per share for the company increased from 30 cents a share in 1987 to $5.48 a share by 2013. So 30 cents to 5.48. Pretty significant, right? The annual dividend in 2013 was $2.64 a share, which is up from 10 cents a share in 87. And the point of this exercise and the chart that we're going to have McKay post or the table is to show you that you should be focusing on the underlying fundamentals and business strengths rather than the stock price fluctuation. I also picked this company, Johnson & Johnson, because it illustrates the need for active management in a dividend growth portfolio. There are a lot of strategies out there that will say, you know, buy the aristocrats or, you know, they just look at one broad category and they say, buy it, and never get rid of it. We don't believe in that. Businesses are changing. Businesses are evolving. The consumer is changing, as we mentioned in last week's episode. And so active management for not only buying yet, but also for selling is incredibly important because in the story of uh, uh, this position, the fundamentals have weakened and it wouldn't have benefit, been a benefit to the shareholder to hold on and, and uh, ride the business into a time of uh, when they're struggling and, and trying to bounce back. Yeah, this is a perfect example of not cherry picking um, a winner, which too many shows and podcasts and uh, predictors like to congregate around. We're talking today about a sale we made because things change. And when the inputs change, so should the outputs. Um, and if you stick to the math and evidence-based investing, I want to back up before we dissect that and compare and share with you my favorite simple objective metric that allows you to never fall in love with a great company. And Johnson & Johnson happens to be one of my favorite companies personally, if I was allowed to have one. The math eliminated from our roster. So I, I never confuse the two. And it's a wonderful, objective way to live. But the evidence behind Jackson's opening comments, if you haven't listened to us before and didn't know that we are firm believers in dividend growth, it's the math of it. It's not a style. It's not a decision we made. It's not a prediction we have. It's the evidence of 
two things. One, if you are an investor listening to this, take us out of the equation. It has nothing to do with us. It's the only metric you can hold in your hand to know it's real. And if it's a business, if the market's closed for more than 10 years, if you're receiving a portion of those profits that are growing, if that's all you know about the business, it's the best clue. It's the simplest. It stood the test of time for 200 years. A lot of those things have things in common. Simplest, longest lasting, best clue. It also, if you're into this, although our focus is entirely on driving cash flow to investors, which we think will be their biggest question over the next couple of decades, how do I get not get another growth or income choice? There's plenty of each is where do I find growth of income? I think that's their biggest question and dividend growth unquestionably solves that more than any other factor. Again, taking us out of the equation for a second. I'll throw us back here in a minute. Don't worry, brother. If you happen to like appreciation, and when I say evidence-based, that clue of dividend growth isn't just what matters for the investor, but it also coincides with the healthiest businesses if you had to pick one clue. Um, they have significantly outperformed non-dividend paying companies over time. They have significantly outperformed steady, high-yielding dividend paying companies. Dividend growth as a factor with evidence to back it up is, is a little bit of meat behind what Jackson shared of why he opened with this. And things change. And Johnson & Johnson, to use your example, Jackson, it gets a lot of love as a lot of great companies do in the stock market. And when he mentioned Aristocrat, that is an S&P company that has raised its dividend for more than 25 consecutive years. That's a pretty good place to start. If that's all you, if that's all you had access to, you're not going to do wrong by owning the Aristocrats. Um, we happen to believe in active management and selection. And just as a simple example of why, the aristocrats' dividend growth rate is currently decelerating, as was Johnson & Johnson. So the growth is there, but rather than look at the direction or the change of the advantage, we want to see is it accelerating or decelerating as a clue on the best clue. And so our current roster of dividend growth is averaging 19% per year accelerating. The aristocrats are less than half of that. Nothing wrong with that. And there's some wonderful companies in there. We're just picky and choose. We don't have to own everything. So when that one company that Jackson mentioned, there's several others, when it falls out of favor compared to the competition, it's why we have stock market tournaments every single weekend, because the inputs change, the valuation change. When the crowd agrees on what's a great company, they often overpay for it. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with Johnson & Johnson. I think it will continue to do great. I think some other less known companies, cheaper valuations with higher growth rates will and already are doing considerably better. The two metrics, you know, I mentioned the best clue um, earlier. I'm trying to get, we have a crowd congregating around this show. I'm trying to turn those noises off for us, Jackson. That we just, I, I don't like to attract a crowd. I like to be un- crowded math. Um, the, the, the two that I promised to share earlier, if we were going to share one of the formulas and then also my favorite quote to back Jackson's comment about let's think of this more as a business than stock prices. Um, the metric is called stakeholder yield. And that is absolutely one of my favorites. And I'll define what that means and why we measure it. It is dividend yield plus net common share buyback yield plus debt pay down. All of those three, if you have any or all of them, is a direct benefit if you are the business owner. You're not trying to appeal to stock price speculators. If you just owned a business and it wasn't publicly traded and you had no idea what the stock market was, which maybe a lot of people listening to this, we've always said the greatest ROI is your craft, your business, your earnings power. Well, business owners would agree that those same three metrics are what drives the day. Um, and long term, when you're not worried about the next quarter. So stakeholder yield, 
we currently average north of 6% on our roster of dividend growth companies. The aristocrats in the overall market is closer to half of that. Again, we're not special. We just are selective and disciplined. And when something falls out of favor, they can be replaced. The quote I promised to share that makes me think of a business owner while we're doing the math of the stakeholder you my Angelo said, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. I can't tell you how much time that has saved me once I adopted that philosophy personally and professionally. So there's a bonus there. You can use in your personal life too. We're in the knee deep in quarterly earnings call right now. And a couple stood out to me as thinking, Jackson, like you said about as a business owner. One, absolutely didn't care one bit what Wall Street analysts thought about their land acquisition costs, their biggest advantage over time, and eventually becoming almost a duopoly, closing in on a monopoly is the fact that they bought their own dirt um, under a very, very, very unsexy business. And they didn't care. They said, well, how do you... Uh, calculate what that'll do to earnings next quarter. He goes, we don't. I, I, I don't even know what it's going to do. I do know that it's the right thing to do for the next 50 years. And it's turned out to be a huge advantage. Um, that mentality, thinking like an owner, and he lived on a trailer on that first piece of dirt to operate the business, not in a castle, not paying himself lavishly, thinking like a business and the math backing that up you can find it. It's not everywhere though. I do think selection matters. There's not hundreds of these that we own. There's no more than 50 for a reason. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, just, just that entire, that entire mindset shift of thinking like a business owner and looking at this long term. Um, it, it's not very common that you, you get that from, um, from two people that are focused on building portfolios for your freedom day or for retirement. So I, I think that this is unique and I'm proud, I'm proud that this is our approach. Buffett uh, had a quote that I really liked, and this is from a 2013 shareholder letter that he wrote to Berkshire shareholders. He said, after we, after we buy a stock, we would not be disturbed if markets closed for a year or so. We don't need daily quote on our 100% position in C's, which is C's candy or H and H Brown, both from private companies. Uh, to validate our well-being. Why then should we need a quote on our 7% position in Coca-Cola? And what he's saying here in this quote is they've looked at the fundamentals. They know what is happening under the hood. Why would they then care about the price movement in the secondary market? They don't, and they don't concern themselves with that. And just because some of these investments that we make are publicly traded does not make the price movement that's quoted on the screens from bright early in the morning till early afternoon here in Idaho, uh, it doesn't make them any more important or uh, influential on your, in your investment. Um, so in that 2013 letter, he, he gave an example of two investments that he made that I thought were really insightful. Um, and it kind of talks about this idea of focusing on the business and ignoring the price. So the first investment that Buffett made in this letter that he talked about in this letter was a farm. And everybody that listens knows how much we love good old fashioned farmers and how much we, we respect them. So I thought this fit into, uh, into kind of our style. Uh, in 1986, Buffett bought a farm. It cost him $280,000 at the time and had a yield of about 10%. Um, instead of looking at the price and what he thought the price would be worth in 10 years or 15 years down the road, he focused instead on how many agricultural products like soybeans or corn it could produce. He looked at the estimated costs he calculated that effect on future uh, productivity improvements. Um, he knew that there would be disappointing years and that there could be a drought, but he knew that over time, because of the fundamentals and the way he saw them, things would be okay. So $280,000 purchase price with a 10% unlevered yield at the beginning. And by 2013, the farm had increased fivefold in value and tripled its earnings. Um, and Buffett said about that farm, he didn't get a quote on that one time. And the only reason he had to get a price was to appraise it as part of the portfolio valuation, uh, valuation requirement that he had. The second one was a, he purchased some property uh, across the street from New York University. So it's commercial property in New York City. Um, when he purchased it, it had an unlevered yield again of around 10%. Um, when he was analyzing the deal, he was looking for ways to improve the position itself. So raising rents when there were tenants that weren't charged market rate uh, for rent. 
um, filling vacancies, um, increasing efficiency in operations, um, refinancing at lower rates, and you know all the different things that he could do. So by the end of this, when he sold it, annual distributions had increased from 10% to 35%. My favorite part of this is he had received over 150% of his original investment in the form of a distribution. Um, and the property had gone up like eightfold. Um, and so annual distributions is what I wanted to focus on in this part. When it's com when your annual distributions are compared to your original cost of your investment, you're getting into what we call mailbox money or the yield on cost indicator, which is what a lot of dividend growth investors will focus on. And that is what I try to focus on primarily when I'm looking at my own investment portfolios. Um, and one of the best ways you can judge the success of your investments over time. So Buffett illustrated this, gave these examples to come up with five principles that I think are worth talking about and going through. Uh, the first one is you don't need to be an expert in the particular field to achieve satisfactory or even above average investment returns. Just this very simple concept of dividend growth and partnering with a successful partner or manager, portfolio manager, or finding a strategy that works for you can produce incredible investment returns, yield on cost of you know, double digits or, or, you know, something very, very healthy for your retirement. Um, and that was Buffett saying that. I thought that that was important. He's not an expert in New York commercial real estate. He's not an expert in farming. He actually relied on for the farm acquisition, uh, his son, Howard, who's a farmer, which I think was kind of, I didn't know that about his son. So I thought that that was important. So for those of you listening that may be intimidated or don't know how to start or how to manage this, the good news is you can, you can find and, and kind of outsource to partners that know how to do this incredibly well. And that, uh, that can be a huge benefit for, for any investor, whether you're using a fund or an advisor or something like that. Um, the second one was focus on the future productivity of the asset that you're considering. So one of the things that Ryan taught me a very long time ago is that we are looking for investments where the dividend is paid from a small amount of the free cash flow as possible as is possible. And if that dividend is growing, but that dividend is becoming a smaller portion every quarter of the free cash flow, every year of the free cash flow, that's indicative that the business is on fire and what they're doing is really, really working. And so I think about this a lot when investors are searching for the highest yield. Um, when you're yield chasing or looking after something that looking for something that is paying this outrageously high dividend, is there enough cash left on the company side for them to continue to grow their revenue, pay down their debt, do these share buybacks like Ryan was talking about with stakeholder yield and continue to grow the dividend for you? I think that is an underlooked and underdiscussed part of this, but I think it's incredibly important. That's why we like stakeholder yield over dividend yield. Often the high dividend yields are not supported. Um, they're being paid with more than 100% uh, of free cash. Um, they're not leaving anything left for buybacks, research and development, capital expenditures to improve and grow operating revenue going forward. Um, the, the, my favorite clue of Buffett's that he's left us is, is the other I wanted to share. It goes back to my Angelou's metric earlier, and it's humility. Um, it, it's, it's the missing ingredient, our own wealthiest investors and partners shockingly simple businesses if you're listening and wondering about this and, and and there's a quote from an earnings call this also that happened this last week that reminded me i wanted to share with you another example of you know the opposite of humility is around us all the time and, and in the stock market it's promotional when you hear people pounding the table promoting their own company maybe selling their company or their shares. And why we mentioned earlier, when I said net buyback, that's key. When somebody announces a big buyback and they're giving all of the shares to executives and options and grants, they're not reducing the share count at all. Um, we like to do the math on net buyback, truly thinking like an owner. If you like that lemonade stand, as I always tell either my little two, if you want to buy out your brother or sister and own the whole thing, what's it going to cost? That's a real buyback and own the whole store. Um, so I was listening to a conference call earlier this week and it, it struck me um, because it was humble. And we'll talk about another 
a, a setback for this particular company. It was a tough quarter and he didn't cover it up. He didn't promote or promise. He really simply said, we're going to go back to our time tested playbook. And I quote, superior service at a fair price delivered on time to help the world keep its promises. And his is a super simple business, by the way. Um, and I had sent him a note. There, there's no more uh, insider information before or after the call and Wall Street analysts. When I started in this business, you were trying to get an edge and try to figure out something that nobody else heard. Now, um, I mean, this fair disclosure and the disclaimers you hear on all of these conference calls before and after, it's real. If they have any information, they have to share it to everybody. You're not missing anything. If, if anybody has ever led you to believe, I heard somebody else talking this week again about the stock market's rigged. I, I will reiterate, it's rigged for the small guy. It, it, if, if anybody, to be able to take a stake in some of these businesses earlier than ever, we have an entire episode about that that you can go back on and listen to. I do suggest them all, all 73. It could be a good binge. Um, so I knew, and I, I not only knew I wasn't going to get anything. I didn't need anything extra. It was a simple compliment and a question because it was over three decades that it took him to be named CEO of this company. And we were talking to young investors or interns or anybody listening to this. Um, I'm a big believer in playing the long game gives you an advantage, which is wind at Jackson Sales here today of thinking like a business owner, not a stock trader or a speculator. It takes a long time sometimes. He started, so I sent him the note and to his investor relations guy, I knew I wasn't going to get him. Um, I said, I just love to hear that very first job because he had been at the company for 32 years and he started at the lowest rung. And you know, I love those gritty stories. Having started in the mailroom myself, it's a small fraternity. And I just simply said, I would love to share this. We write to our own partners the reasons behind some of these dividend raises, right? Where and what they have in common. Um, and by the way, just to add a little context, this tough quarter, um, this company's done okay. The, the, the last 30 years, the stock market, the S&P is up 2,000%. People say you can just own the index, just own the market. Don't worry about active management. Don't listen to guys like Jackson and Ryan. This particular company is up 37,000%. I only share that, not to cherry pick, to emphasize he absolutely shouldn't have needed to call me back, nor did I expect it. But the simplest and humblest of questions, what was your first job? How gritty was it that nobody wanted to talk about it? I don't care about this quarter. We're thinking like a business owner. We know this business. Immediately responded, yeah, he'd love to talk to you about that. And all I want to do is share it with any young people listening and reading our stuff because the grittiness matters a lot. Um, playing the long game, thinking like a business owner, takes a long time. And if you can get paid along the way, it can be magic. I absolutely love that. I think that's the perfect place to end. Hopefully everybody gets as much out of this as I did because this was a good one uh, for me to go through and listen and just remind myself that it's incredibly important. If anybody out there would like to schedule a meeting with our team, you can email us team at freedomdaysolutions.com. You can visit our website, freedomdaysolutions.com. And with that, we will see everybody next week. This show is brought to you by Freedom Day Solutions, LLC, a registered investment advisory firm advising individuals and families nationwide. Performance is not guaranteed and past results are not necessarily indicative of future performance. To learn more, visit freedomdaysolutions.com. This show contains general information that is not suitable for everyone and was shared for informational purposes only. Any forward-looking statement or opinion expressed is subject to change without notice. Nothing contained herein constitutes investment, legal, tax, or other advice, nor is it to be relied on in making investment or other decisions. Clients of Freedom Day Solutions may hold positions in the securities discussed.